Hello, my name is Paul Gilbert, and it's a welcome to the Creative and Compassionate World series. And today I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome one of the real pioneers in pushing compassionate care in the health service, who's worked for many, many years on developing compassionate leadership. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So just let me tell you a little bit about him. So uh, Professor West was, is a senior visiting fellow at King's, uh, the King's Fund London, a professor of organizational psychology at Lancaster University, visiting professor at University College Dublin and emeritus professor at Aston University. Um, he graduated from the University of Wales in 1973, uh, same year I graduated actually, and was awarded a PhD in 1977. Uh, this was for research on the psychology of meditation. Now, when I read uh, this, Michael, I didn't realize you'd done your PhD on meditation. Fascinating. He has authored and edited and co-edited 20 books and has published more than 200 articles in scientific and practitioner publications on teamwork, innovation, leadership, and culture, particularly in healthcare. He is fellow of the British Psychological Society and American Psychological Association, the Academy of Social Sciences, the International Association of Applied Psychologists, and the British Academy of Management. He is an honorary fellow at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. He was appointed a CBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2020 for services to compassion and innovation in healthcare, and very well deserved too. Um, Michael, welcome to the Creating Compassionate World series. So my first question really is to ask you, um, how did you uh, get into this area of compassion? So thank you, Paul. And it's a real pleasure to be with you and to have a conversation with you. I don't know, I suppose one tends to construct a history in retrospect about life journeys, uh, but I think probably it was a confluence of a number of streams. Working in the NHS, I was struck so often by the incredible love and kindness and selflessness of people in various organizations across health services. And, and I suppose that awareness of compassion as a core value in the NHS gra gradually bubbled up into my cloudy consciousness. Um, but at the same time, as you say, I had an interest in meditation from my undergraduate days, actually, and it's always been a part of my daily life. And, and I've had an interest in various philosophical and religious traditions that are associated with meditation, inc including Buddhism. Um, and of course, in most traditions, certainly religious traditions and most philosophical traditions, compassion is always a core human value. And, and I suppose what happened with all of the research in positive psychology, with my experience in, in health services and with my own, I suppose, philosophical orientation, compassion emerged as being utterly core. If we are to understand how we create communities in both work organizations and in society generally that enable people to flourish and be well and live their lives happily and in a fulfilled way. Yes, that's, that's such an important, I think one's personal journey into these things is really key, isn't it? And I notice in your brilliant book, here it is, your brilliant book here, um, you use the definition of sensitivity to suffering in, in self and others and prevention, which I think is extremely important and highlighting the fact that, <clears throat> you know, people think of compassion as kindness or whatever, but really at the center of compassion is what you also say here is courage and wisdom because the courage, the courage of compassion to be able to enter into people's worlds of suffering is such an important issue, isn't it? Particularly when it comes to compassionate leadership, the, the courage to lead those individuals who are working with the suffering of others is, is really quite, a, quite a, a special skill, I think. I think it is about courage and it is about authenticity. I suppose what I found almost visceral in working in the context of healthcare is the suffering of staff, particularly currently. We, we see that there are, in the NHS National Health Service in England, there are around 100,000 staff vacancies at the minute. 
levels of stress have been climbing steadily for some years, even before the pandemic. There were over 40% of staff reporting that they were unwell as a result of work stress in the previous year. And we're seeing staff quitting in very large numbers. One in four nurses leave the NHS within three years of joining. And amongst doctors and general practitioners, a specific type of doctor, we see levels of turnover at the highest that they've been since we first started surveying back in the 1990s. And it's because primarily, I think, that um, we are placing people in working conditions that are intolerable. And that all of that, I think, is a failure of leadership. You know, if we if we say that people are our most important asset in organizations and we see very high levels of vacancies, turnover, stress levels, intention to quit, then that, I believe, is a failure of leadership and that what is needed is compassionate leadership. And we've got some great examples within health services of where leaders have the courage to deeply listen to those they lead. And I, I think it does take courage because we hear things as leaders we wouldn't want to hear. You know, the problem I have is inadequate staff numbers or chronic conflicts with the radiology department. And then it requires a commitment to understand the courage to empathize, to feel what it's like to be a nurse on your third 12 hour night shift in a row, but actually you've done 14 hours every night. You haven't had time to go to the toilet. You haven't had the opportunity to get some nutritious food on your shift. You haven't been able to take a break. And now you've got to drive home and you're terrified of being in an accident because you're so exhausted. So it's the courage of leaders to, to be prepared to empathize with all of that rather than to hide from it. And then particularly, as you say, um, the courage to ask the question, how can I help? What, what can I do to help? And that, that's courageous sometimes because leaders may not have the answers. They may not have the answers to workforce, workforce shortages. But I think the role of leaders is not necessarily to have answers to all of these questions, but it is have, to have the courage to commit to engaging with those issues and the most important and difficult challenges that we face. Yes, I think that's such an important thing. I mean, as you know, I worked in the health service for 40 years. We did some research with Paul Crawford, who's a professor of nursing in Nottingham, and we found that actually the big issues for uh, nursing staff in the mental health services were anger. They were angry with the system and how the system treated them. They weren't being stressed by their clients. They weren't being stressed by the patients. So oh, there's too, too much suffering. No, no, quite the opposite. They were saying, look, I, I need to be able to spend more time with my patients. I'm not giving them the care they need because I've got so many people on my waiting, on my list or whatever it is. And so the point that you're making is it's really the way in which the service is constructed that expects too much of people and does not allow individuals to do what they've been trained to do, which is to produce high quality care. And our experience, our research showed that nurses and doctors were leaving because they couldn't work in the way they wanted to work. It wasn't that they were being burnt out by too much suffering. It was, it was not that at all, actually. Yes, and the the... The problem of moral distress of staff knowing what they want to do, which is to provide high quality care, continually improving care, compassionate care, but not feeling able to do it because they don't have time or they don't have the right numbers of staff or they don't have the right equipment, just is corrosive, not only as it were emotionally, it's corrosive physically. So we know that for example, the problem of chronic work overload has an impact on staff, cardiovascular disease, uh, addictions, alcoholism, cancers, diabetes, depression. And that's in large part the reason why so many staff are quitting, why absenteeism rates are so high. On the other hand, Paul, we know that when leaders behave compassionately generally in an NHS trust, they attend to staff, listen to them with fascination. I think it's the most important skill of a leader. Uh, when they seek to understand the challenges that those they lead face, when they empathize with them, and when they help them, and that's the most important task of a leader, I think, is helping those they lead 
to do their jobs more effectively by helping to ensure they have the resources they need, the right numbers of staff, etc., and and helping to remove the obstacles that get in the way. We know that when in trusts, when leaders behave generally in those four ways, that that has an impact on staff satisfaction and engagement, which affects patient satisfaction with the care they receive, which affects care quality and financial performance and avoidable patient mortality. So it's not just that ideologically this would be nice to have as a, as a leadership style. It is precisely those leadership behaviours across an NHS organisation which predict the very outcomes that we're seeking to achieve. And it's the absence of them we know from the National Staff Survey data which we've been collecting now for 18 years, over half a million people every year, the absence of those leadership behaviours in the NHS organisations is associated with staff work overload, dissatisfaction, stress, patient dissatisfaction. They're not treated with the compassion and respect and dignity that they wish for, and that affects care quality and, again, financial performance and, and higher levels of avoidable patient deaths. Yes, I mean, that's such an important thing. And the other thing I want to raise with you is this compassion for leaders, because my experience in the NHS is right, it comes right from the top, from the, from the government, um, that actually puts so much pressure downwards through the management system, you know, because I see chief executives who didn't, if they didn't meet their financial envelopes, they lost their jobs, you know. So I think the threat in the system is from the top. And really, it's how do we help leaders who are themselves under a lot of threat um, to be able to manage their staff. Because I think some of what you see in, in leaders, poor leadership behavior, is they're acting out of their own threat. They're not supported. And we used to try to say to leaders, like you, you need to have your own support system. You need to actually form groups where you can support each other um, because the pressures on the health service uh, to you know particularly when you have all these cost cuttings i mean you know we <laughs> we would be told we're going to have an efficiency drive and then the leaders would say i'm terribly sorry but we're going to freeze your posts and you say well how can that be efficiency yeah mm -hmm. but it's what the government wants us to do we have to cut you know 20 percent of our budget this year we have to do it but we have to sell it as an efficiency saving but it was just ludicrous it was lying and I think that's the part of the problem we've got with the health service is that when you've got that kind of deception coming through the service, the leaders in the health service are really under so much pressure themselves. So one of the interesting things I'm interested in is how do you how do we support leaders to support staff? <clears throat> I think you're absolutely right that that in the English National Health Service there is this um, this control culture and it does I think stem from central government and the need to retain political support because we're spending public money wisely and of course the NHS is a huge sector with 1.4 million employees and and I think what we've ended up with is a multiplicity of national bodies I think at current count there are something like 19 all seeking to control the various NHS provider organizations which actually deliver the care that often don't talk to each other. I, I, I remember going in 2015 to the first meeting of the executive teams of these national bodies. It was the first meeting ever in 2015. And I'm not sure there has been another one since. So they've all, they're all seeking to control the organizations and they're also subject to the demands of political masters and all of this control and fear and blame and punishment that ethos gets transmitted down and so you find senior leaders in NHS provider organizations trying to almost create an umbrella over their staff to, to the best leaders do to protect them from the um if you like, toxic reign of national control. I mean, one of the bizarre, I suppose, features of our health service, and I must say, I think this varies between the four United Kingdom nations. So in Wales, I think the situation is very different. There's a much more community orientation to health services than I think there is in England. But one of the bizarre consequences of, 
consequences of all of this is we have the largest, probably the most skilled and most motivated workforce anywhere in industry in health services, yet we manage them largely through extended hierarchies and command and control. So I know from my research that the most successful organizations in the world, regardless of sector, usually have no more than three or four reporting levels. And regardless of size, yet in the typical NHS hospital, we see reporting levels in double figures and every reporting level you add, adds about 10% to bureaucracy, it's estimated. So you create this oppressive system where a lot of work and energy is focused on, as it were, um, massaging the system rather than being focused on the delivery of high quality care. And that's immensely frustrating for staff who are spending, you know, I talk to nurses at nursing stations who are spending their time filling the same information in on three different forms rather than doing what enables them to feel good about themselves and their work, which is delivering compassionate, high quality care for patients. So it, it, um, it, it, it doesn't need to be that way because we also know we've got examples, many examples of health care organizations that have created entirely different cultures, Northumbria Healthcare, Royal Bournemouth and Christchurch, Mersey Care. You know, Mersey Care has created a, 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 what they call a restorative culture rather than a fear and blame culture. And they've all but eliminated disciplinaries and suspensions. Northumbria, Northumbria's strategy as a healthcare organization is based on uh, the most intense gathering of data of, about patient experience and about staff experience on a daily basis. And that determines the strategy of the organization. And, and what we see is much lower levels of stress, much better care quality, higher levels of patient satisfaction, lower levels of staff turnover and so on. So it, it, it um, you know, part of my role, I suppose, is continuing to broadcast out as much as possible the evidence we have that tells us that compassionate leadership in organizations from top to bottom and end to end is what delivers the outcomes that we seek. I think that's, Michael, I think that is absolutely wonderful work. And I think that's a message that we do need to get out that, you know, through the work of these organizations that you mentioned, you know, we don't we don't have to stay in these silos of threat and fear, you know, there are ways in which we can break out and people are becoming very innovative in generating compassionate organizations and compassionate leadership. And, you know, I would recommend people have a look at your book because you've got so much um, written in there about these processes. Um, and the other thing I suppose that's quite interesting um, is this movement towards the interactions between communities and health services. We know there's a big breakdown in social care and, and, and so forth. I mean, one of the things that I came, sort of influenced me quite a lot was when we had, you know, payment by results, because that really did mess up quite a lot of interactions between community and, and health services. I used to run a groups for, you know, mildly depressed agoraphobic people, and then we'd bring in more people and more people. So we had these big groups of su people supporting each other out in the community, and then manager says, no, you can't do that because you have to, do, you have to deliver nice recommended therapies. You can't do all this stuff. But in fact, the evidence was we were preventing relapse and, and improving the quality of lives and so forth. So I think the other thing that we need in the health service is actually to think about not health, not just as this in this place called a hospital or whatever, but actually health is something that we have to create the conditions for within our communities, right? That is producing compassionate communities, producing compassionate care. We've got a huge wave of mental health difficulties as a result of COVID coming. We're not gonna be able to deal with those by providing more and more you know, nurses or therapists. We've got to find how can the health service at the care service interact with communities interact with social care and i and i think you've got some ideas about that as well if i um, understood you from your book yeah so i i think that the model of having a, a health service which it rather paternalistically doles out health care to a supplicant population yeah. is not sustainable it, you know it's failing at the minute we're losing so many staff um, uh, even before the pandemic, we were seeing 
declines in um, quality of care and the and the waiting lists were going up, the length of time people were having to wait for care was going up, and we we were seeing an epidemic of loneliness in our in our communities, many elderly people not seeing anybody for a month at a time, and and that's just that's just hugely painfully tragic. And I think we the model that we have to move towards is a recognition that our ability to create the conditions where people are able to live happy lives, fulfilling lives, feeling safe, feeling loved, whether it's young, we were talking before we began the recording about our grandchildren that, you know, where every young child is able to live feeling a life, feeling safe, feeling loved, feeling cared for, the same for young people, the same for adults feeling fulfilled, the same for elderly people, people facing death at the end of their lives, feeling safe, feeling cared for, feeling loved. H how do we create these conditions? This should be the question that we're asking ourselves as a species constantly. And I think the answer to that is, it's about recognizing that all of those agencies, if you like, or communities that affect that outcome must work together in, in an integrated supportive way. Um, we must take advantage and, of and support the amazing work of the key people who care in our community, unpaid carers who look after their children, their mothers, their grandparents. Um, and we must work with volunteer groups so that they have an equal voice in not just with healthcare services, but an equal voice with social care, with local authorities. And I think we're beginning to see a movement in that direction. So, of course, what we tend to do is to create more complex institutions and structures. The latest one is called, and they're called integrated care systems. But I think they represent potentially an important step along the way towards um, a situation where we have all of these agencies working together, education, police, local authority, social care, as I say. And, and the we have examples of where this is beginning to happen. I, I had a lovely conversation last week with Fatima Khan Shah from West Yorkshire and Harrogate, uh, which is an integrated care system involving now about 40 local organizations working together to support the community. And one of the things that they've been able to do during the pandemic is ensure a vaccination system that was really effective. So they've worked with mosques, with um, key influences in communities to persuade people of the value of having a vaccination during the pandemic. And, and so they've seen their role as being to bring together key influences, key agencies to respond to that particular emergency, but they're also treating it as a template for how to work in the future for the benefit of, of, of the people who make up our communities. And it's about, so it's not, it's not only about being compassionate towards the people we provide care for, it's building compassionate relationships between organizations, not based on who's the most powerful, who's got the biggest budget. And, you know, there are lots of examples of where this is happening. I've just, prior to us, Talking this morning, Paul, I was having a conversation with uh, Julian Abel from Froome in Somerset, who I think you know, and who's been creating a compassionate community there. We see examples in the Bromley by Bow Centre in London, where uh, local volunteers, local people provide social care, social prescribing, uh, visit elderly people, involve them in conversations in social groups. And we see it in places like Alaska, which has introduced the NUCA system amongst very challenged populations with high levels of alcoholism and drug use and suicide, uh, where Native American leaders now lead the system, all the agencies involved come together. They don't talk about patients anymore, they talk about citizen owners, and they've had huge impacts on outcomes. And again, the Montefiore system in New York, which is focused on or in, in, in the very challenged area of the Bronx, focused on how do we deal with the underlying problems, the underlying causes, which end up with this young woman arriving in accident and emergency on a Saturday night, having had a drug overdose. Um, it's not just about treating 
the person in that situation, but addressing the underlying causes of poverty, of lack of social support, of um, lack of education, of lack of income, so that we address these problems. And, and I think that there are really uh, encouraging, hopeful signs of green growth in this new approach to integrated uh, care amongst all of the agencies in the community to create more compassionate communities generally, rather than in some sense, institutionalizing compassion as though that's what the, the NHS does. So it's a responsibility of all of us to create um, communities. And, and that compassion then I think extends in the way that we should seek to nurture our interactions with each other, but also with our, our wider environment, with the biodiversity of which we're a part, with the planet. It, it, it's a, if you like, a worldview and a way of being, not just a, a bunch of skills that we accrete onto what we already have. Yes, I think that's wonderful. And for those of you who are interested, it's um, um, Julian Abel and Lindsay Clark. It's called The Compassion Project. It's a fabulous uh, book. And also there's a, a person called um, Costello who did The Social Edge. Um, he's done some wonderful work in developing countries looking at integrated care, like bringing women together in the prenatal period, postnatal period, and showing major drops in postnatal depression. So I think this is a, a, a key issue of what we're thinking about when we think about compassionate leadership in healthcare, is that the leadership is also about breaking out of these ideas of a narrow biomedical view of medicine, and it also requires leaders to understand that health is a product of multiple factors to do with social relationships, to do with diet, to do with exercise, all kinds of things. And that's why um, if we can see health as something that is produced partly through our social relationships, the, 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 the things that support health through our relationships. Uh, and for example, you know, all the work on cancer, that if you are part of a supportive network, you, your survival and your, your quality of life is much higher than if you are dying alone, as it were. All of these things are really important to get leaders to understand. It's not just about, you know, are we delivering this specific treatment in this specific way, but it, it's how we open it up. And the work that you're doing, and as you say, Julian's doing, helps us to do that. Do you think, I mean, how do you think leaders will buy that though, when they feel that they can begin to open up around this idea of integrated uh, social and uh, health care? I think it's a really difficult challenge, Paul. I think it is. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, you know, and, and I think that the reasons go deep. I mean, your work has been, a, has had a huge and positive influence on the work I've done over the years, and particularly the evolutionary perspective on, on, all, on all of our experience in this amazing existence that we have. I've been really influenced in my career and my thinking by ideas around intergroup behavior and identity. Uh, you know, we, uh, compassion, uh, you know, was selected for because it enabled us to create family groups that could enable our children to grow and be safe. And it enabled us to form bigger tribes that Robin Dunbar has talked about in terms of numbers of people that we um, we're comfortable interacting with because those family groups those tribes enabled us to be safe from threat to share resources to raise our young in an allo centric parenting way um, but also over time I think that those tribes those um, groups gave us a sense of identity of you know who I am um, so I begin to define myself as growing up in Wales, as um, a meditator, as enjoying rugby, as loving cycling in the countryside, and, and we, uh, as a male, and so we accrete, an, we, we build or sculpt an identity. And we know from social psychology that one of the consequences of that is that we tend to favor in groups over out groups. And in its worst form, that can lead to the demonization of out groups and to all of the atrocities we see in in-group, out-group behavior across the globe in terms of torture and genocide and horrible wars and religious wars. So it's very easy to say we're going to create an entity called an integrated care system where health and social care will work together along with the local authority. 
but these are already tribes. They're already in some sense silos. So it's actually quite difficult to get them to work effectively together. And I, I think that the work on attachment theory, on belonging, and the work on intergroup prejudice has given us five key, if you like, um, guides for how we can work together across boundaries more effectively, whether it's with other teams, other departments, other organizations. And the first is there has to be a, a really inspiring, um, authentic, sincere vision of what we're seeking to achieve together for our community, um, for the people in our, to live fulfilling, happy lives, because that shared purpose gives us a shared identity. It gives us a in the jargon of social psychology, a superordinate identity. And second, we have to ensure that we see this as being uh, a relationship or a set of relationships which are long-term rather than short-term. Uh, and you know, attachment theory tells us we have to have a sense of stability and continuity in relationships. So, so we have to, I think in practice, that means setting long-term objectives. And the obsession of many of our systems with objectives for the next three months, six months, nine months, I think is not helpful. We should be thinking about the next 10 years, 15 years. Some Native American communities plan for the next 70 years or next 150 years. And that changes the, the dynamic of our relationships. Ah, oh, okay, so this is for the long term rather than just another government reorganization. And third is having frequent contact with each other across boundaries. So healthcare, working with social care, working with voluntary sector organizations, so we build trust. And fourth is managing conflict in a, in a courageous uh, way, leaning into it in a mutually respectful, open, transparent way, because conflict is both an indicator of innovation and an outcome of attempts to innovate. And if we don't know how to manage it effectively, then it leads to a breakdown in relationships across boundaries. So that's about, uh, if you like, um, uh, nurturing and understanding of how to work through conflict in a way that enables us to build psychological safety across these different boundaries. And the fifth and final um, important learning, I think, from all of this research is that we have to create a, we have to develop a norm where each organization or entity or agency always ask the question, asks the question of the other, how can we help you? What, what do we need to do to help you so that collectively we deliver for the communities we serve? And that's what I, I think you see in places like Froome, where Julian Abel's work has been brilliantly pioneering in the NUCA system, in the Montefiore system. We're seeing in West Yorkshire and Harrogate and in the Wigan um, deal uh, in, in this area, that, that there's that norm of rather than saying what's in this for us or how can, we, how can we hoard our resources, it's asking the question, how can we share resources and what can we do to help you? And I think that has to be the way we go for the future. Yeah, I mean, that's wonderful, Michael. There's, there's five key points, absolutely fantastic. I mean, the, the thing that I love about a lot of the work that you're talking, the conversation we're having is this integrated processes of what we might call biopsychosocial or whatever, because we've also got issues to do with how we can introduce biopsychosocial medicine really in a much more profound way, um, you know, because, you know, we're under a lot of pressure from the pharmaceutical industries who want us to see these disorders that they need drugs and all that stuff, particularly in, in mental health, which is a kind of a, a key problem. So helping us to understand that leadership, when it comes to health leadership, we have to think about what is it that helps us become healthy, what helps us stay healthy, and what helps us to recover from times if we become unhealthy or Ill, have ill health. All of these things require integrated services. And um, what are you doing in terms of a lot of your work, and you just spoke to it beautifully, is this integrated process of thinking. You have to think this way before you can begin to solve the problems that way. And what your work does in the leadership book and other things that you've written is think about it this way. It's like Julian's work, think about it this way, and then we can lead it this way. 
So, I mean, a couple more questions really just to ask you on a, on a personal level. What, what are your sort of personal challenges in the work that you're doing and trying to bring these wisdoms into the world? One of the key issues is, is something that you talked about earlier, Paul. So I find there's almost no resistance to these messages when I talk with people in healthcare. There, there is a, an intuitive understanding that compassion is key. It's key to who we are as a species. It's key to our survival. It's more to do, I've, the challenge I see is more to do with the kind of institutions we create. So I, I'm, I'm working continually to, to drip, drip out the message that these national bodies that I talked about must, must examine their own cultures. So it's, it's, it's not sufficient to say from a, an elevated hierarchical position, you must change your cultures to create conditions for high quality, continually improving compassionate care. And we demand that you do this immediately. Yes. And if you don't, we'll fire the chief executive. Yes, that's right. I mean, it's just completely <laughs> paradoxical and counterproductive. So for me, there's a challenge about how do we change the culture of these national organizations? And uh, I'm, sort of constantly trying to get the message out to these national organizations that your culture is a huge part of the problem and in fact when we look at staff survey data from national organizations like nhs england nhs improvement we see that the cultures the staff experience in those organizations is worse on average than it is in the N the nhs providers so that's not only that the argument that it's not only that they're not providing a great model it's that their cultures are not fit for their purpose because they're not creating institutions that are being compassionate, that are attending to the other, to the organizations they're there to enable and support. They're not seeking to understand the challenges of those organizations. They're not humanly empathizing with them. They're not seeing empathy as an institutional responsibility. Far from it, it's all very rational and intellectual and mechanical and pushing levers and they're and they're often not asking the question what can we do to help so in a, in a way the cultures that they that they're advocating we should create uh, are precisely the cultures that they themselves are not embodying so that that's a, a real challenge I, th I think the other is um I, i'm i think during the other personal challenge for me is it, it's been heartbreaking during the pandemic to both to see the loss of life amongst um, healthcare staff, the illness amongst healthcare staff, the huge pressures they've endured. I mean, people came out at the beginning of the pandemic clapping on a Thursday night for, for, for carers and other frontline staff. And that was lovely. It brought communities together. But we're now nearly two years on. And the staff who were exhausted then are now tired of being exhausted and when I talk to NHS staff, I do find it really painful to hear just how damaged uh, they have become as a result of their compassion and their selflessness and often the lack of support they're getting from some of their leaders. And, and I must emphasize, as I said earlier, there are so many shining lights to give hope uh, amidst some examples of where there's bullying and harassment and uh, 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 and a lack of empathy for staff. So I think, yeah, changing the institutional cultures is important um, in the context of recognizing the enormous compassion and pain that staff have, uh, compassion that staff have offered and the pain they've experienced during all of this. Yes, I mean, that's such a, because, you know, we obviously have dealings with, and people who've been through some awful, awful experiences, it just using PPE I and mean, when you, you can't even go to the loo without having to undress and you're constantly sweating and constantly having, not, I mean, it's just been horrendous. If people really knew what these folk have gone through, it's just been awful, hasn't it? The thing that I would also discuss with you is I think this one of the issues we have to deal with is threat because we've got 
you know, if everybody's operating through their threat system, and you know, we've got a media that likes to hammer politicians, and we know that many politicians are always looking out over their shoulders to think, what's the media going to do? What's the media going to say? And the whole, we've created a, a world really where at one level we are the most compassionate and we've got a wonderful health service, but at another level, we've just got constant threat, 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 threat. And my interest in this whole series of creating a compassionate world is how do we address that? Because we can create a compassionate world, but not if we have the top echelons of society constantly creating threat. It's, we have to address that. And so what I'm interested in, and some of what you're talking about, is how do we support the leaders in the system who are themselves under a huge amount of threat and are themselves sometimes go into a little bit of denial because that's the only way they can cope with all the pressures upon them. How can we help those leaders to be compassionate to themselves and to their fellow compassionate leaders, really? And I think in your book, you say a few things about that. So, I mean, what would you, what, what, what are your thoughts about how can we bring compassion to the leaders themselves? I guess what has been most important in in addressing that issue has been the notion of self-compassion and it's really quite a difficult topic to engage with with senior leaders but also with healthcare staff because I think there is something of a um, a norm within healthcare and amongst healthcare workers where our focus is so much on delivering care for other people that the idea even of thinking about turning that compassion inwards is almost um, anathema, almost anathema. And, and yet we know um, that the foundation in a way, or a foundation in order to be compassionate towards others, I have to take care of myself because I feel threatened, I feel afraid, um, at times I can feel um, greedy, and, and so it's really important to, I think, learn to be self-compassionate. And in practice, I think what that means is having the courage to be self-aware in the moment, having the courage to be aware of when I'm feeling angry, threatened, hurt, inadequate, ashamed, as well as the positive emotions we experience, joy and connection, and then having the courage to accept those feelings rather than repress them or deny them or, you know, add another layer of problem by beating ourselves up for feeling inadequate or angry. And when we accept them, then we know from things like acceptance commitment therapy, it's an opportunity then into, to inquire into them. Why am I feeling like this? Oh, I've just come out from this meeting where somebody was quite aggressive with me, so I'm feeling hurt. And then having the courage to turn, and to turn the light of love or empathy, nurturing to ourselves, to care for ourselves. Uh, after all, each of us is as deserving and needing of love as every other human being on the planet. And, and then that enables us to take intelligent action to help ourselves. So I think that that, that self-compassion enables us to connect deeply with ourselves, with our being, with our core values like courage and wisdom and compassion. And when we connect more deeply with ourselves in that moment, through that moment to moment awareness, then that I think enables, enables us to connect more deeply with those we lead, with those we provide care for, indeed with everyone inter we interact with. And I think this is, you know, this is not just another leadership skill we need to teach. It, it's about a way of being, of being aware in the moment, both of in my interaction with you, in my interaction with others, and in my interactions with myself, so that then I can choose to, uh, to give myself the necessary support and caring and compassion that I would give to another human being in that circumstance. So I think that's, a, that's something very personal that all leaders can do. But I also think that, that there's, there's something about compassion being a vector 
that isn't unidirectional. It's a way of being, as your work has really described, and that followers can show compassion to their leaders, um, that leaders can show compassion to each other. I believe one of the most powerful ways we can transform our large organizations is through reducing hierarchy and building team-based working. You know, I, I've in, in the work that I've been doing on team working over the years, all of the research I've seen suggests that we've been working in teams since pretty much the beginning of human history for the reasons that you describe, the need to create families, the need to share resources to, to, to get food. We've got anthropological evidence of early humans herding horses into a canyon so they could kill them for meat, very complex team working behaviors. And, and if so, so team working is a natural way of being, of natural way of working for us as human beings. And we know that it makes a profound difference to our effectiveness. It makes a profound difference to our well being when we work in well structured, effective teams. So I think what we need to do is almost recreate that basic form of human endeavor of activity of excellent team working in organizations. Because what we've learned is that, particularly during the pandemic, the th what enabled people to cope was the compassion that they got from their immediate team members. So recreating compassionate team working, I think is another really powerful way of helping teams. In the NHS, we know only about 40% of people work in teams with clear objectives that meet regularly to review their performance. There's enormous scope for improvement. And the more people who work in teams with clear objectives and that meet regularly, the better the care quality, the better the staff mental health, higher levels of patient satisfaction and dramatically lower levels of patient mortality. So I think it's both, you know, two, two practical ways of addressing that issue. I think one is, one is developing the skills of self-compassion amongst leaders, and two is developing much more effective team-based working across organizations. Yes, I think that's terrific. And I mean, if in both cases, I think the dimension of what we would call friendliness, friendly face, friendly voice, friendliness is extremely important. There's some very interesting work coming out now on hunter gatherers that suggests that even modern day hunter gatherers, one of the key things is playfulness. They're playful with each other. They create positive affect between each other, which in attachment terms means they create a secure base. And when I certainly started in the NHS back in the late 70s, I was an assistant nurse, um, the staff had a real sense of community. So we'd always go out and celebrate other people's birthdays. We would always come together. There'd always be a sort of a, a dinner dance on Christmas, all that sort of stuff. By the time I left the NHS, they had all gone. I mean, you know, on a, you'd go on to a ward now and some of the staff hadn't, didn't even know each other because they were being moved from one ward to the next. And you say, well, what about Fred's birthday. Oh, we, um, I haven't got time for that. I really haven't got time for that. The whole sense of playful connectedness had gone. You know, we're here to do a job. That's what we do and so on and so on. And what you're saying is such a fundamental issue that actually at root, what creates supportive teams is a sense of secure base and basic friendliness, basic friendliness. You know, that when you sit down with your, the person in the team that you're working with, you can have a smile, you can feel safe with them, as opposed to feeling, you know, in some of the board meetings I went to, that people just sat up straight. They were so rigid, you know, so worried about how that team meeting was going to go. So basic friendliness and playfulness, I think, is uh, really important. One last question before we go, because it's been an absolute delight. So, you know, how would you like to see your work moving forward? What is, what is it that inspires you? What is it that you, you're looking for? You, you, you've told us some wonderfully inspiring things today about what different uh, groups are doing, different um, health services are doing. What, uh, what are you looking forward to in terms of taking your work forward? I'm, in, I'm enormously encouraged by the, by the fact that we are making such progress in reinforcing the importance of compassion as a core value. The, mm. the review by Treziak and Mazzarelli, Compassionomics in Healthcare, has been very powerful in reinforcing that the fact that compassion is the most important intervention there is in healthcare in terms of the outcomes we seek. I've been really encouraged 
that, for example, Health Education and Improvement Wales, the national body in the NHS in Wales, has uh, committed to a 10-year strategy to develop compassion, compassionate leadership for the whole of health and social care. Compassionate and inclusive leadership is now at the core of the people strategy for the NHS in England, the people plan for the next 10 years. Uh, in Scotland, um, compassionate and inclusive and collective leadership is also at the core of the leadership strategy for the whole of Scottish government. In Northern Ireland, they've had a collective and compassionate leadership strategy that they've been rolling out now for the last three years. So it is amazing in the space of about six or seven years that compassion and the concept of compassionate leadership have really bubbled to the surface, if you like. And I think, Paul, your work has played a huge role in enabling that to, to happen. Um, I, what, what, I, what now has to happen, uh, what has to come out of all of that hope has to be implementation. So it's, it's the, now the, the hard yards of turning that very positive rhetoric into reality of how we uh, not only assess levels of compassionate leadership across the entire health and social care system, but how we ensure that system has an orientation of compassion. So not saying we're going to admonish people for not having sufficiently compassionate leadership, but we're going to ask the question, how can we help? What can we do to enable people to develop um, compassionate cultures? How can we ensure that we're better, better meeting the core needs of staff at work rather than just recognizing that they have those needs? How do we how can we begin to address the key questions of chronic work overload, of poor team working, of rigidly and ridiculously hierarchical cultures, of fear and blame? And so it's translating those great aspirations and the great commitments into a reality that affects people's experience on the ground. And by the way, I think the long term benefit of all of this is for our society as a whole. I think the NHS, you know, it's the biggest employer in the country, one in 20 people. If we take social care as well, it's one in nine people. If all of those people go into work every day and encounter compassionate leadership and compassionate cultures, then they take that back out into their families and communities. If all of the, what is it, 1 million people who use NHS services every 36 hours encounter compassionate care, they take that back out into their families and communities through processes of emotional contagion. So I think the NHS and social care have the potential to continue to transform our society, to be a more compare compassionate and caring society so that everybody can live more fulfilling, happy lives in the future. That's terrific. And we can also train compassion. People can be trained in compassion. They can learn to develop empathy. I mean, today as a therapist, I'm still developing new ways of finding ways to be empathic. Oh, I didn't realize. Oh, that's interesting. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. You are one of the leaders and bringing compassion into the health service, but also our understanding about what compassionate leadership is. It's, it's a wise form of courage to make possible change for the better for all of us, really, in the health service or wherever. Um, one last question. If people want to get involved with compassionate leadership, is there what would you suggest? Is there any sort of movement for compassionate leadership or any links that you would suggest? There are so many um, uh, uh, sources of wisdom. I think that the work you do in the Compassionate Mind Foundation is a really important um, is a really important source of knowledge and wisdom around all of this. And indeed, you know, it's it's such a delight and privilege for me to talk to you, Paul, because of um, your influence over all of this work. And uh, uh, I think that. The most important thing every individual can do is to relax back, as it were, into their compassionate selves and to be present with others in interactions. I think that's the starting place, to be present with the other, to relax back into being present in every interaction. 
not to beat ourselves up or demand it of a, just to relax back into being present, to listen with fascination, to feel with the other, and to have an orientation of wanting to help, wanting to make a positive difference for the other person. I think that's the most powerful thing every individual can do. That's great. And compassion can also be a source of great joy. Michael, thank you so much. And um, we will meet again in not too distant future, I hope. Thank you so much for your time for the Creative Compassionate World series. It's a pleasure and a privilege for me, Paul. Thank you.